I kept going back to it over and over again. That's great. Yeah, um, that's one of my favorite tracks on the new album too. Um, 48th Dream was just kind of something that was birthed in the studio. Um, our drummer, Michael Hebner, he had written this melody. And um, I think he and Armando, our bass player, got together and just kind of riffed on some ideas. And um, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Um, so then, um, you know, I also, um, I have Brazilian and Scottish ancestry. And so mm. I started learning the Berenbau. Um, oh, awesome. And uh, yeah. And so, you know, like in like one of the final sessions for this track, you know, I said, hey, guys, is it cool if I played Berenbau on this? And they were like, oh. sure. So. Um, so yeah, the same session that I recorded that bagpipe, uh, motif that happens at the end, I also laid down some Baron bow. And so, yeah, that, that became 48th dream. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, that's really interesting. I was, so I, I, I maybe was, um, I didn't know that this would come up so early in the, in the interview. Um, <clears throat> but you mentioned that, so, okay, well, a couple things actually. So one thing is that I did feel like, was, was the Baron Bow, were you like um, basically running right alongside with the chanter um, with that Baron Bow? Were the two of them kind of moving along with each other? Or was um, it more droney? Or, or what were you doing with the Baron Bow there? Because my, my ears might not have picked it out well, but I felt like there was something that I thought maybe was a synth or something back there. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple things going on. I know um, Armando, because so when we track in the studio, we track drones and chanter separately. And yeah. uh, Armando had taken um, some, some, just some drone samples and he'd run them through a bunch of effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's that kind of that, uh, that kind of like really echoey, like reverb yeah. kind of like, kind of like pad that he did. And so, um, so he did layered that on top of, um, on top of some drum stuff that Mike did. And then, and then I think the Baron Bow on top of that, the Baron Bow is like the boom, ba -da -da -dum, boom, boom, ba -da -da -dum, Oh, I see. So it's more, more plucky. I was, I was yeah. imagining it bowed. I got gotcha. you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Now the, the Baron Bow, it, it, there's no frets, right? It's like one of those free string things, right? It's just, yeah, it's like a long bamboo stick with a metal string down the side and then a gourd, which kind of acts like a resonator. Mm-hmm. And so you've got two tones with it. You've got like the, um, they're basically a half step apart. And um, mine happens to be in B flat. So it goes perfectly perfect. with where we pitch our pipes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Gotcha. Well, and then the, the other thing that you brought up that I, that I was wondering about is, um, it, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this is niche or not. I don't know. Do you ever get into reggae music? I've, I've been oh, excited yeah. about reggae for a long time myself. And I wondered about that actually just listening to your music. Like mm. sometimes I did think like, I, I feel like I, I feel like maybe I have a guess at some of the stuff these guys listen to, you know, outside <laughs> of piping, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. We, yeah. We have a lot of different influences. Um, you know, I, I've listened to, I've really explored the catalog of like King Tubby um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the dub, uh, you know, dub stuff. I really, I really dig it. So. Right. Yes. That's definitely. So, so have you ever heard of, uh, there, there was a, there was a duo, it, it was a bass rhythm duo that did some stuff with like, with some of the early, like Bob Marley and Peter Tosh guys. Um, there was Sly and Robbie, uh, mm. Sly Dunbar and, and Robbie Shakespeare. They, I, the only oh, reason. Oh yeah. I, yeah. You, Those you, names you, ring a bell. Those names ring a bell. Yeah. They, they were kind of a big deal. Like, like they were, they were kind of like a rhythm and bass duo that would like huh. just, you could just like plug them into just about any reggae concert hmm. in, I don't know what, what decades would it have been the sixties through eighties. Right. They would just show up playing with anybody, you know, in so a they're like, show. they're like side, they're like side men. Yeah, they were like sidemen, and they were as okay. a team together. And then they were also, they were kind of a big deal, like, in studio after that, kind of during the transition directly into dub. As as reggae music started to become electronic, they were a big part of that. Um, mm. And I did wonder about that, because, like, some of the stuff you guys are doing did kind of make me think of that. But you mentioned that, that um, oh, what are their names again? I, I hate to be dismissive of your, of, of oh, Michael yeah. and Armando. Uh, Michael and Armando, Yeah, Michael right? and Armando, you got it, yep. You mentioned that they were grooving on something together. You know, mm -hmm. and that's that's one thing I wondered, like, especially with the most recent album, it felt like sometimes, man, part of what is so good about a piping album, I think, you know, that you wouldn't expect is when a piping album isn't all pipes, you know, when it can feature some other stuff, too. And I right. felt like, especially in this uh, newer, this newest album, I felt like, man, it sounds like sometimes you really get this like clear connection between Michael and Armando, not that you're being left out in any way. Right. But like, there's such a, such a, what I hate to word, use the word synergy. Cause I don't, <laughs> I get tired of hearing that word at work all the time. Right. But there's something right, special right. about what's going on between those two. Um, so yeah. it makes a lot of sense to me that they would have grooved on something, you know, together. Cause it feels kind of like, kind of like Sly and Robbie. They're kind of like oh, this, cool. this single unit. You know what I mean? These two mm. people who are a single unit, if that makes sense. That's, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting that you pointed that out because this was 
definitely um, like a deviation from where we how we worked in previous albums. Mm -hmm. um, so, and Michael and Armando were definitely at the helms of a lot of the um, you know a lot of the the brainstorming sessions and stuff. So, gotcha, gotcha. Well, it, now I feel like I've taken up too much space myself, um, but I also <laughs> feel like I want to hear another track. So, what if what if we stick in track one from Let's like hop back to the shape of okay. piping to come, and okay. let's maybe let's take a sample from Blue Holes. Sounds good. Feels appropriate to start with track one. first uh first songs that i wrote for this band um you know um i uh at some point um you know i decided that i wanted to take a, a left turn with with my piping and um venture more into uncharted territory um i started listening to um the late rufus harley and um <laughs> i had that question too <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah, that's, that's part of my journey but um yeah, yeah um, so, you know, it became pretty clear to me that, you know, sticking to like traditional scales and idioms wasn't going to really cut it if I was trying to do something original. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was listening to Rufus and um, was hearing a lot of like minor pentatonic um, scales because that's kind of his main mode when he does riffing and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. um, unbeknownst to me at the time, like it was kind of hard to get the um, the pentatonic scale with, um, with, with traditional uh, notes and stuff. And so... I think I was watching this Lincoln Hilton uh, kitchen piping session or something that he had submitted mm -hmm. and he was playing like the Ghostbusters theme and he kept like putting his knees together to close the channel to get um, mm -hmm. what sounded like a low F sharp. Yeah. And so I was like, I don't know. I was just kind of like, I was inspired by that. And so I started taping my practice channel and I realized that if I tape both sound holes on my practice channel, I could get a low F sharp. But I also realized that um, in doing so I created a, 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 like a minor pentatonic scale going from low F sharp to high F sharp. So low F sharp to A, B minor third, then um, B is the four, then C, you know, C sharp is the five, then 
um e is sub minor seven to back to f sharp so like mm -hmm. and then i started riffing on it and i was just like i just created this this melody that i liked kind of like with the hornpipe feel and mm -hmm. um i called it blue holes because you know in jazz and blues the blue notes you know mm -hmm. would give you the give you the feel and you right. know the the so so the you know so i sort of i decided to call it blue holes titling you know plugging the holes on the bottom you know of the channer you know to you know bring out the blue notes in the bagpipes and so that's kind of why i called it blue holes so that man i love that story behind the title that makes so much sense like i'd assume like yeah. oh it's a, it's it sounds nice like you got to throw words on whatever you wrote right but no that's <laughs> and it's so cool that that's track one on on the shape of piping to come since it's like an origin story in in so many ways that's awesome thanks man yeah it was kind of the thesis for you know what our band was to be right so so then how did how did it become the band like how had you written had you been messing with this like years before you started gathering the group together or was it kind of all at the same time um you know uh so you know in 2009 um uh i i i, I joined the renaissance festival circuit mm -hmm. um as a bagpiper and uh the solo you know, at the I, time I, yeah i was solo i was i was just kind of like a freelancer um mm -hmm. i was um invited to play in this group called tartanic um that performs nationally um cool and they do a very traditional uh repertoire but mm -hmm. they add like you know big uh big drums and um they have a you know really kind of fantastic show i'm looking um, them up right now yeah yeah so that was sort of my foray into the renaissance festival circuit um but shortly after i played with them i had an invitation to play with this group called volgamut and volgamut does german medieval bagpipes mm -hmm. um and uh What's really cool and unique about them is that they have a lot of interesting arrangements. Like they'll take medieval music and um, the the band leader, uh, whose name is Michael Gartner, he'll arrange it in such a way that is very contemporary. Hmm. And so um, when I joined Volgamut, I, I was in, you know, I met um, the drummer in that band at the time, who was Michael Huebner, who I would eventually start the Freestylers of Piping with. Hmm. And um so it was, you know, through my experiences with Volgamut, kind of like seeing what bagpipes could be out of the traditional, um, you know, Scottish format that I became inspired to write, you know, and, and compose my, my own music with the hopes of starting uh, my own band one day. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it all happened. So there, there are, so that's one thing that stood out to me <clears throat> as listening, as I was listening through your entire catalog of, of what you've done in the studio is that there's a surprising lack of like, um, oh, how, how do I put this? Like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be rude to anybody. Like whatever kind of art they're doing is totally cool. Right. But it seems like it would be very tempting for somebody. If you've got a Highland piping background and you're trying to go into this, like, oh, um, make it cool kind of thing where it'd be like, <laughs> I'm going to play Scott and the Brave and you guys, you know, <laughs> I'm going to play a little bit fast and you guys play drums in the background. You know what I mean? Like there's right. I, there's a surprising lack of that, you know, uh, in your in your albums. Though I was curious on uh with the the notorious jigs. Mm. I don't, I didn't recognize any of those, but were any of those did any of those happen to be like jigs that you'd picked up in your in your pre-freestyler days that you are, you know, molding and and messing with or or is that not the case there? Uh those were those were actually um all all original jigs that i wrote all, all um, original so i don't have to feel bad about not recognizing these track jigs, right <laughs> not at all no <laughs> good, good. no and and that's the thing is you know because when we first started it, it was you know taking that left turn into the non-traditional was a process i mean um a lot of, all the stuff that i wrote originally had like a traditional influence you know sure. a traditional feel like you know i would start off you know writing jigs or i would start off writing reels or like blue holes was you know intended to be a hornpipe mm -hmm. so it's it's like yeah i mean i think you can hear the traditional influences the most on our uh, on our first album the shape of piping to come i really like that I, though like i mean like i listened around to tracks on, of your stuff before mm -hmm. like before you and i talked about doing this interview and so like i was i was familiar with something like the cultivator for sure you know i definitely right. had heard the cultivator a lot of times <clears throat> before then oh cool but having you know having this interview as a reason to like almost make this studious um i listened through chronologically several times you know and that was really fun because it's like early you can hear hints at what will become a major theme later in a way you know what i mean it's oh, uh, like that I, yeah I, I really enjoy like the willingness of an artist to put stuff out as they're in process of figuring out what their sound is 
makes oh, for awesome. this really cool like uh like history book almost where you can go in a time machine and see how stuff comes together um, thanks man yeah and so maybe, but maybe tell me a little bit about that uh traditional background had you played with pipe bands um how did you get started on a practice channer take me way back yeah um i mean you know this is this is that question that <laughs> every piper has answered a million times mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so um so for me you know the journey started when i was probably like 11 or 12 years old and um you know i i was uh doing some research into my family uh you know history and um, my grandmother showed me my great grandfather's kilt, mm-hmm. um, which is the Duncan Tartan, and you know it's just mesmerizing to me when I was when I was you know that age. And um, shortly after, I think I saw the movie Braveheart, and um, you know I, I kind of you, you know yeah, I told my grandmother I was really into this, and so of course, what did she do? She signed me up for Scottish Highland dance lessons. <laughs> and and so, grandma, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <I> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I mean, I I thought it was cool. Like, I mean, you know, like the sword dance was really intriguing to me. Yeah. You know, at that age, it's like, wow, you know, you get to dance over a sword. You know, it sounds dangerous. It sounds cool. Not not Sign to up, not so. to be like too like gender conformist, but I've always felt like the sword dance is the best marketing to get young men into <laughs> dancing. Like, well, there are weapons. Oh, I'll do that. You know. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, and I was I definitely fell for it. So, um, yeah. So I signed up for that. I was a dancer. I danced for like three or four years did highland dance but you know at some point um yeah i mean uh uh, you know i was looking around the classes well i'm the only only guy in here and i think i was not at the age to really be able to appreciate that yeah that was not um, yet a bonus (laughs) not quite yet no and so um so i think i expressed interest in doing something um different you know uh learning the bagpipes and so um yeah you know I, i got a teacher um picked up a practice channer and um started you know my lessons and Mm -hmm. um so uh that's kind of where the journey begins was it was it always solo from the beginning or did you find a band to play with um it was uh you know uh the the town that i grew up in uh the city uh, tucson had a a scottish arts society and the scottish arts society uh had uh, basically a lot of different types of um organizations within it so there was the seven pipers pipe band um, you know, there was the the Highland Dancers, uh, which I started with. There was a country dancing group. There was like a, a Kaylee band, mm. you know, all, all under the umbrella of um, the Seven Pipers Scottish Society. Mm. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I got some friends out there in, in Arizona. Are you are you still out there in, in Arizona? Or have you, I feel like you're, did you say, you're, I live in LA. You live in LA. You're, yeah. That music video for The Cultivator made me think that you were on the East Coast for some reason. Like some of the places <laughs> that you were at and stuff, I was like, oh, that, that's got to be what, New Jersey or New York or something. But that must have been <laughs> yeah. California, huh? Yeah, we were in um, East LA. Um, yeah, wow. And the City Terrace is where we filmed that. Um, we actually had a fan that we met at one of our shows. And um, she invited us to film a music video at her at her house, which is which is where that video was filmed. So I really like that video a lot. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It made me like it. And this is not a dig at all. This is praise. It made me feel like transported to my childhood. It had such a like (laughs) such a like, oh, like a like a late 90s. like mainstream <laughs> punk rock kind of feel like some of the footage is sped up and it's like the band running around pissing off the the lame neighbor and the, and the cop Good. and that kind of thing you know it's like love it yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. definitely yeah the, i mean i used to watch like vhs like punk rock videos with my yep. with my best friend in high school and yeah even when i'm watching that i get that kind of nostalgia yeah. as well <laughs> very well done i love that <clears throat> As, speaking of uh, Lincoln Hilton, that well, I shouldn't say Lincoln. Like, I shouldn't give credit where it's not due. Of course, Lincoln Hilton's a big deal, right? But he did a really great belly dancer uh, tune hmm. uh, or cover, and then, and of course, that's a Gordon Duncan tune, right? And so, yes. here's my here's my laying a whole lot of pipe to <laughs> to make a connection. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's. We'll, we'll, I'll insert a little sample of the belly dancer here as well from your first album. Okay, because um, I really like that. Um, <laughs> So the the thing is, it, having listened to some of your work already, if if I hadn't heard this track and somebody said to me, "Oh, they uh, they they do a Gordon Duncan a, a Gordon Duncan tune," 
<laughs> this is the first one I would have guessed that you that you would have done. Um, <laughs> so, is is Gordon Duncan as big a deal in your piping as he is for for all pipers, <laughs> or is this tune in particular one that stands out to you? Yeah, Gordon Duncan was a big deal. I mean, uh, for me as a piper, especially with the last name Duncan. Oh, that's um, true. That's that's right. And, and sorry, I meant to ask you too. I don't know tartans mm-hmm. well enough to know off the top of my head. But do you wear a Duncan tart or tartan kilt when you're like doing your your Ren Fair sh- shows and stuff? Uh, um, no, actually, uh, uh, um, I don't wear a kilt when I play at the Ren Fairs. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm the. It's funny how our, our imaginations can fill in the gaps. I was kind of just imagining, but now you mentioned it. Yeah, the, you, you yeah. got like more, more, more like medieval looking uh, fluffy trousers, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and fluffy. that was. Uh, I mean, like loose, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not quite um, parachute pants. Right. <laughs> right. We started with the um, we started with the with the Scottish look. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of uh, that's what a lot of the uh, bagpipe bands on Ren Renfair Circuit do. You know, it's because it's just something a lot of bagpipers have you know you have a kilt you know then you buy a jacobite shirt you throw it together right and then, yep yep you know, that's, yeah, that's and then uniform yep yeah yeah but it, you know at some point we decided well we're deviating from from the scottish stuff uh you know musically we might as well aesthetically uh, mm. too so that's you know so i put down the kilt and i put on the medieval parachute pants and uh, the rest is history <laughs> I I don't want anybody to feel upset with me, but personally, I think those medieval parachute pants are a lot more comfortable anyway. I, I, don't, I don't have anything against kilts, but like worrying about messing up the pleats and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little more um, cash. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's got that going for it too. Yeah. Do you, yeah. And do you feel like part of it is the um, the modalness of the belly dancer? You know, you mentioned like mm. like in how how Rufus was grooving too. You know, I wondered mm. is, is this part of what drew you to this tune as well? I think it was the time signatures. Oh, um, gotcha. Yeah, I think it was the odd time, you know, the odd meters and stuff. Because mm. uh, a lot of the Renaissance fair bands um, dig like playing in in seven and five and like um, stuff breaks you know. my brain, man. <laughs> yeah, it was I, I can a little... do two, four, and eight, and really, uh-huh. you, you get to like sixes, <laughs> and it's still throwing me off. So the odd numbers. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, like. It, it just it kind of made it more challenging yeah. for me eventually because because i mean like um with the vogue the, the the band that i you know that i went on tour with for like um six or seven months we had this tune called peak zeben which is like a um a finnish uh, folk song or something i think it was mm. yeah and uh and, and it was in seven and it just had this roar and it was just it was the coolest thing i think i'd ever played at that point i just i loved to play that tune but the band leader he would always push back when i'd ask him if we could play it for the crowd because he's like the crowd just doesn't get it they don't <laughs> he was, get i was it, like huh? he was like they just don't get it he's like <laughs> but i'm like but i love to play it so the, anyway. my entire context for anything in seven is money by pink floyd that's, that's the only right. one i've ever been able to help hold on to <laughs> yeah yeah it's a classic classic seven groove the um the, I, I think it's cool. I'm going to look up Volgamut because I, 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 it's intriguing to me that the the angle they were taking was medieval music arranged to contemporary style, where I feel like what's more common is to take a contemporary pop song and arrange it in a medieval style, you know, or do it on <laughs> medieval instruments. And so go in the other direction. Sounds like a lot more work, but also sounds a lot more interesting to me. Right. I heard that's a that's kind of a thing recently, like a bard core. Yeah, bard core. That's right. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I listen I to hardcore. Like, I'll admit it. Oh, cool! Yeah, you have to give me some uh, recommendations. Yeah, man, there's some, there is some good stuff out there for sure. Nice. <laughs> um, and it feels like we got to we got to kind of put a pin in it. And and when when we're looking at that album, the shape of piping to come, that's from 2015, mm-hmm. right? Um, yes. So it's been a minute. Uh, there's a track on there that the titular track, the the shape of piping to come, was track eight oh, yes. on there. Um, yes. So we got to talk about that one. Um, so I'll play okay. a little bit of it, a, a little bit of it. Um, and actually, I was thinking. Maybe I'd play a bit of track seven too, because that that's the heavy hitter. Because I really like the way the heavy hitter goes into the shape of piping to come.
so uh, so the heavy hitter um, was uh, I wrote as an homage, uh, uh, an ode, I guess, if you will, to uh, to Michael, the the you know the drummer in our band, because mm. he just plays that tapan with such force, and yeah. the tapan is is you know the big drum, uh, looks like a bass drum, but it's got two different sides, so it's got a boom side and a, you know a kick, like a like a boom cat boom cat, you know, right. so he. Watching well, he just play, played. you wouldn't know where that, that second hit is coming from because it's like <laughs> underneath, right? So it's like, what's he doing over there? Yeah, yeah, but he just plays it with such force. And like, he's a he's a big baseball fan. Like, he's, a, he's from Philadelphia, so he's, he like rocks his Philly, Philly's gear all the time. And so like, you know, I was just thinking like, well, he's like a baseball player, like the way he plays that drum. Mm-hmm. And he's got such a punk rock feel to it. I was like, you know, like, like I want to name it. I'm going to name, I'm going to write a tune and I'm going to name it for him. And I'm going to call it the heavy hitter. And so um, I used uh, there's a song on Queens of the Stone Age album, uh, song for the songs for the deaf. It's called Song for the Dead, and uh, and it's just like it's just you know the most punk rock thing on the on the album. So I used that as kind of an influence when I when I wrote the tune, you know. And I, I've sent even like the music, you know, like the the the, the MP3 to the guys in the band. Mm. So that was the backstory for Heavy Hitter. But the shape of piping to come um, was sort of where I wanted to see the music go because um i specifically wrote out space for solos and um and i wanted our music to kind of go into the realm of jazz and you know jazz is and um, improvised solos so i wrote it with the format of having a head like a you know a main theme that would that it would come back to and then um and then uh left bars open for 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 eli our original second bagpiper and myself to take solos so, okay, that's one thing I was wondering about, is if you were doubling tracks with yourself or if you had two pipers on that first album. No, actually, the um, yeah, the first uh, the first album we had two bagpipes, um, gotcha. myself and uh, Elijah Wolcott. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Awesome. So so from there, then just moving through the albums, is is the next one from 2019, is that the, is it pronounced Tupelo? Tu, Tupelo? Tupelo. Mm-hmm. Is that, is that Portuguese? Uh, it's actually, uh, uh, it's actually a, Tupelo, it's um, named after Tupelo Turn, which is the street that Mike Hebner's parents oh, lived on in I Delaware. See. I was <laughs> guessing that it was like, not knowing that you had any Brazilian ancestry before, I was thinking maybe French or something. Like it must be like a word for like a triple turnaround or something like that. Right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there no, you there's. Go. I, I yeah. have to shatter the mystique of that. <laughs> I know, I know. No, uh, it's funny though, because yeah, when, whenever Mike writes something, he just picks a random like street or place that he's lived or some location that was significant oh, in I his see. life so yeah so that's why you have things like um like you know farewell to king sessing which is on our new album which yes. is like farewell king sessing was like i don't know like an apartment building he lived in, in <laughs> that's so funny because like, like the even the use of the word farewell right it just <laughs> yeah. feels like some sort of gravitas there you know and so i was like <laughs> king king sessing it must have that must be like a i don't know an an urdu word for for a for an emperor in the in the middle east or something like that you know <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It's good that like, you know, even when, when our stuff is named after mundane things, there's still a mystique around it. That's, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good, uh, you know, not the intention necessarily, but it, it's a good. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I felt like and here's another thing that I like about your albums is this this sense of there being like an overture and then like a an ending note, like your albums are a, a thing. You know, it's not just a collection of tracks. Oh, cool. And, and I feel like that that album from 2019. Sorry, was it Tup- Tupelo? Tup- Tupelo Turn. Tupelo yes. Turn. So I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right. No uh, problem. It, it feels like right from the intro, there's a statement happening here that's like, we've got some new stuff for you. You know, like we got some new instruments, we got some new sounds. Here's a Definitely. sample of what you're about to hear. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Um, and, and from there we go into, into Thunderclapper. Um,
I, what, but I, I wanted to ask about runaway, the runaway reel. Um, yeah. what, what about these ones? Are these all originals as well, or any of these trad gins yep. that you've remolded? Yeah, those are all original uh, reels that I wrote Look at that, together. Man. I, I'm going from impressed to more impressed. You didn't, you didn't <laughs> lean on your on your track like the the common marches at all for these albums, did you? Uh, not at all. No, and, and that was very intentional. I mean, our whole point was to do new stuff. Yeah. I mean, like so when I wrote these reels, you know, I I, I wanted you know every reel to have a key change because that's another yeah. thing that I'm big on. It's like it's like I, I mean, I just you know I'm so. I got so tired of the traditional, I mean, everything sounds in the same mode, everything's in the same mm -hmm. key, you know, you're either, uh, you know, B-flat mixed Lydian, or you're, you know, or you're, you know, uh, D major, you know, or you're, or you're B minor, you know, it's like, um, you know, it's just, uh, so I wanted to do something uh, right in different keys and different modes, and so that's kind of where I went with this one. This is probably something that, that anybody who listens to this show is tired of me asking. I maybe uh -huh. have my own hang up here, but uh -huh. when you're since you're since you play on a B flat channer, uh -huh. when you're writing, 
both when you're thinking about it, if you're tinkering on a keyboard, when you're writing it out in software on paper, et cetera, mm -hmm. is that all happening in like written B flat or are you working it out in concert A, you mm -hmm. know, and then translating that when you get on your pipes, you know, since the t typical pipe notation is in A rather than B flat. As, as yeah, well. that's a great question. This is actually, um, and it fits in chronologically with where we are in the, the albums too, because, um, you know, uh, prior to the Tupelo turn, we never had to think um, outside of uh, the, the bagpipe scale. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like Eli and I were playing together. <clears throat> and so we were using, you know, we were treating the bagpipes like like it is, you know, as a transposing instrument, but yeah. never having to actually transpose. But then, you know, when the Tupelo turn uh, came out, you know, we started playing with a bass player. And so uh, our bass player, Armando, uh, is really... Uh, knowledgeable i mean he went to he, he has his master's in music performance mm. so uh he really gets it and we explained to him what was going on with the bagpipes and so i wrote all my charts for him you know in the in the bagpipe you know uh it, you know in a basically and and he he transposed them to b flat dang that's a that's a bass player you got to hang on to man that's awesome yeah <laughs> yeah but there's more uh he actually um so you know if you know like uh you know anything about stringed instruments like you know it's it tunes uh, open e on the bottom then a then d then g mm. um so when he played he actually uh he actually tuned each string up a half step mm. so that he can he can actually read our charts in a but he's playing you know he's playing them in b flat because right. he's tuned his strings up <laughs> so there you go. There you go. yeah so, so it makes it plain to easier too yeah that exactly is handy. have you ever tried yeah. a concert a chanter and taking your drones down even further I've never, I've never dropped down to low A. I haven't either, but that's, that's kind of the next purchase that I'm like thinking about yeah. is like, oh, maybe it'd be fun. I don't know if yeah. things get unstable the further you go or what, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think like low is the way to go. And I know it's contrary to what popular opinion might think. And um, Oh dude. Yeah. And, competition and, piping only goes up. It's going, <laughs> Yeah, we're going to reach yeah. a critical mass someday. I don't know when we're going to get there, but man, stuff keeps climbing. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm telling you, man, like there's low is the way to go. And I didn't realize it until I played in Volgamut because those medieval bagpipes are in a, mm. uh, a Dorian. That's the, that's the, that's the home key for, for those bagpipes. And I was just like, wow, it sounds fat. Like it just sounds bold. Yeah. It's nice. Mm. Making a case for a, that's, that's one of the things. So I have a, <laughs> my oldest, well, uh, I've bought like practice chanters and drumsticks and pads for like all my kids, even though like way before they were ready for them. But my oldest mm. is finally like actually learning bagpipes in earnest, but oh, this cool. is on the tail end of having done like four years of piano and music theory as well. And so now yeah. I'm having to explain to him like, okay, all the stuff that you learned about music, <laughs> like <laughs> you got to ignore some of this stuff and pretend like it's not the case when you're <laughs> learning bagpipes. Right. And I'm, yeah. and I'm kind of watching this happen in his head. It's like, well, it's fine. But at the same time, I'm like, why does it have to be this way, you know? And it's so like partly <laughs> as like like even more motivated for like the sake of the future generations. I'm I'm like, yeah. why can't we standardize, you know, and let's pick one, B flat or A. Let's make our yeah. instruments play that and let's make the notation match it too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, I'm only one man. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I think um I don't know. I think that some some of the you know newer generation is starting to latch on to the benefits of uh, music theory. I know that um, I don't know who I follow on Instagram, but some of them, I think maybe, maybe the National Piping Center always posts mm -hmm. um, blog blog uh, blog posts by a guy who has studied music and tries oh, to educate Oh, is it people. Timothy Cummings? Because he, he, write, he writes some very music theory-ish stuff for them, for sure. I've seen some it could be him. That could be it. He's yeah. out of Vermont, a small piper more, I think, these days, but he's done a lot of highland piping, too. Any, anyway, I wanted to ask you about Rufus yeah. as well. You mentioned Rufus. Oh, I, yeah. I like Rufus a lot. It took me a while mm. to like him. I think a lot mm -hmm. of pipers, the first time we see or hear him, we go, what the heck? He's just he's just squeezing yeah. them. You know, like, he's not really doing mm. anything. I think it takes mm. some listens to realize, no, he is doing something, and it's cool. But yeah. I also am curious, because I haven't, like, studied his life much, you know? Mm. Like, I once saw a picture of his son next to a painting of him. Mm -hmm. That's about as much, like, digging into his story I have done, yeah. is seeing that photo. Yeah. You know, like, I mostly have just yeah. listened to his music. And so, um, in fact, he, his has been my favorite to use. I'm trying to make, like, some little Instagram ads for my mm. for my bagpipe uh, clothing uh, uh, thing that I'm doing. And it's... Uh, yeah. I love using his tracks for it. I don't know, just partly because of the uniqueness of it and partly because I've yeah. just come to love his music. But do you feel like he knew what he was doing? 
Or do you feel like he stumbled upon some stuff by accident that ended up working? Rufus is an anomaly. Um, He is my favorite bagpiper in the history of bagpipes. Um, He, and I've actually gotten close with his family too. Have you really? That's awesome. Yeah. um, I I just, uh, when I was in DC, I was in Maryland at our last gig and I I, I had lunch with his youngest daughter, uh, Noah. And, um, America, who is uh, his son, um, who you referenced, is in that painting. Mm-hmm. Um, he and I are close, and I've played a couple gigs, and I've even done a, a recording session with him. Oh, that's so, awesome! What does he play? I didn't even realize he was a musician. Yes, he's a he's a trumpet player. Gotcha, handy, and so handy. A couple of B flat instruments together, huh? <laughs> you got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I'm, I've, I've become close with this family. Um, the, you know, the story behind Rufus is that he uh, he heard the bagpipes um, on TV during uh, the late John F. Kennedy's funeral procession, mm. and um, and he was inspired. So he um, he's from Philadelphia, and I think he took a train to like Manhattan and bought um, bought a set of bagpipes from a pawn shop, and um, I think his first pipes were like Hardy's, you know, mm. like. Um, Anyway, um, so he, he basically took him home and he, you know, he's self-taught. Um, and, uh, uh, but his background, I did actually, sorry to interrupt it. I did actually hear a story about him. Maybe you can tell me if this is true that when he was learning neighbors would call the cops and he would hide the bagpipes. And when the cops would knock on the door, he'd be like, what are you talking about? Do I look like the kind of guy who would have bagpipes in his apartment and the cops (laughs) would leave him alone and he'd go back to practicing? (laughs) that's a true story that's from what i hear story. yeah 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 uh, yeah that's, that's it yeah actually um actually if anybody wants to dig further into you know the story of in life of rufus harley uh his family just released an album called the keys of justice which um is a live concert that he put on and it i mean the music is great but the highlight i think of the of the cd is all of his talking in between the songs because oh, really? he basically tells his life story in between all the, in between the, you know, between the music. And, uh, I'm pulling it up right re- now. I'll put some links to this album in the show notes as well. Yeah. The keys of justice is really, uh, it's great. And, um, I mean, I learned so much about Rufus and so much about his ideology. I mean, he's just, he's got an amazing, uh, message I think about, about life and, and just, uh, yeah, it, the more I know, the more I learn about him, the more, in love and enamored I become with, with who he was and just, you know, his vision and his music as well. So yeah. that's awesome. So, so then tell yeah. me about your track Rufus and we'll, and we'll play a little bit of it as well. Did this come together from, you know, is this based off of his music directly? Were you jamming? Did you write it out precisely oh, and carefully? What, what's up with this track? Yeah. So Rufus, I mean, you know, as, as, as we know, you know, when, when, when you admire somebody, you know, in a pipe band or your community, you know, it's tradition and, you know, pipe bands to like write a tune for somebody for sure like yeah. that's that's what i did with heavy hitter you know for for mike you know our our, our drummer the cultivator yeah. uh which we talked about earlier i wrote for our old bagpiper eli oh um, gotcha. yeah but rufus um you know i i said you know i said to myself why doesn't you know why hasn't anybody ever written a song for rufus Hart? you know i mean it just it seems so obvious like you know like <laughs> and especially with how how much he'd come to inspire me so um you know, by this point, I figured out that you could actually do a pentatonic scale without taking down the lower sharp. I was like, okay, well, you know, if you just play C natural, you know, you can do the same thing. Mm-hmm. So I, so I took that and I just kind of ran with it. And so, um, so I tried to make the funkiest sounding like hornpipe reel that I could imagine. And so that's kind of what became Rufus. It's just like let's just bring out the funk, and um, that's kind of what I tried to do. So that was, and I've been so, you know, in doing so, that's I dedicated it to Rufus. Well, not not that I have any right to say, nor that it needs my approval, but it seems to me like something that if he can or if he could hear it, I think he'd like it. I, think <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. You know, it's funny, though, because on the studio recording, um, Mike and I, the drummer, we actually had some back and forth. He didn't want the track to be so short because Rufus, when we performed it live, didn't have like that introduction or middle section. It was just the hornpipe, and we just played it straight through twice. And uh so um, the album version is different from the actual kind of artist vision for that. So I see, I see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but longer. The album version is longer than what you would have done live, huh? Yeah, we tacked on like an introduction, which right. was actually ripped, ripped from like an Outcast album. 
um, and then uh, we put in this French um, uh, song. In Wait, the a, too. an Outcast al- album, as in like a, an album that you guys decided not to make, or as in like like oh, uh, Andre Three Thousand and as in Andre Three Thousand and Big Boy. Uh, Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The intro is uh, Spotty Adi Dope Delicious uh, from from Aquaman Eye. Um, oh my goodness, you're right. Which, it is. I didn't even yeah, realize. Yeah, which when you mentioned the reggae thing, I mean that's you know obviously they're like reggae team. Right. I, dude, I, I I like the track, but I did not oh, make good. that connection. You know, <laughs> I, I, as, as like Andre Three Thousand is is eh, probably my very my very favorite um uh, artist in the in that genre in that area at least right. Yeah. And so yeah. No, this is just delightful. I'm gonna go back and listen to that with even more <laughs> even more joy now. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool and yeah and the, and, the, and so so yeah so it's it's sort of it's sort of uh, bookended or you know it starts with the uh, with Spotty Adi Dopalicious and then we and then we do we do the James Brown hits the bum 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 yes. bum 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 and that was that was like that was intentional like I wanted that I wanted that tune to start with James Brown hits because I mean like I said I was trying to bring the funk out mm-hmm. so I was like okay so I'm gonna write out. Rufus <laughs> write Ru- Ru- write a funky piece for Rufus complete with James Brown hits and then yeah yeah so then um. And then in the middle, just to kind of go completely to the left, we went, we, we threw in this tune that we played with Volgamu, which was uh, called the Tordillon. And in Volgamu, we played it, it's, a, it's in three, it's in three, four. But Mike was like, well, let's write it in four and put like a backbeat behind it. Mm. So so we actually rewrote it as this you know, intermission kind of piece and then went right back into Rufus. So, I feel like that, that, that even adds like more to it that like it, it feels like and again I'm I'm no I'm no Rufus Harley professional here right but it feels like yeah. the fusion of like disparate ideas and 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 traditions and genres it was key to what he was doing and so to do you, that in the track yourself feels like a meta homage as well um, you're right actually and now that I think about it um in that album the keys of justice he does a whole medley of um, national anthems on the Scottish oh, bagpipes really? interesting so so yeah once again it's like yeah it was not intentional to think of it like that but now that you uh now that you mention it i'm like wow yeah i guess so <laughs> yeah it's like it's like there are multiple layers of connection here right it's like <laughs> keep digging it's in the dna of this track <laughs> yeah That's yeah really it's cool, cool. Man. so so then then you you came out with this more, most recent album right now as we're recording it's the tail end of 2022 i think probably this episode won't come out till the beginning of 2023 um hmm. so but while we're talking this is this year's yeah. album um, yes, and I don't know. Speaking of maybe pulling ideas from from other artists, maybe we can hop over to uh, um, just the first track, Sunny. Um, okay. Here's another one that it actually it took me a minute to realize that I'd heard something like this before, and that's part of why okay. I think it's great because it's like it's not just a carbon copy of the original. But are you are you a big disco guy too? Like how did this how did this happen? <laughs> what, what made you go? I'm gonna put that on bagpipes because I would not have made well, the connection personally. <laughs> Yeah, what made us do Sunny? Um, well, I guess the backstory here is that, um, you know, we released Tupelo Turn in 2019. And then, um, you know, the next year, obviously 2020, um, the world shut down. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I found myself working at home uh, with a lot of free time. And um, I think it was around the same time, actually, I got connected with, um, with Noah and America, Rufus Harley's uh, children. And, um, and, uh, you know, started talking with them and just deciding that I was, I, at that point, I just decided I'm going to dive deep into um, being a jazz bagpipe player. Um, you know, I was like, I got the time now, I'm working from home and I'm going to start, I'm going to, I just, I'm just going to do it, you know, because like I've already, I've already started to, you know, explore the surface of what Rufus did, but now I just want to dive in. So, um, so I started taking uh, lessons, uh, music lessons with, uh, with a friend of mine from college uh, who, who studied jazz, and uh, he's a saxophone player, and um, so I, 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 you know, I, I, I was meeting with him weekly, and he was teaching me kind of like the foundation of jazz theory, um, and I already had a, you know, decent understanding of music theory, but I'd never taken it to, uh, to, you know, to jazz, so, um, so we started working together, and I started practicing, improvising, and um, you know the freestylers were getting together and you know, doing jam sessions because we weren't gigging, you know, because all the rent fairs were closed, and just starting to kind of like you know dip my toes into improvising. 
And um, so then, you know, out of nowhere, Armando comes up with this idea. He was like, he was like, you know, I've been thinking, like, what kind of, you know, what kind of tunes would work for you to just, uh, you know, just, just, uh, just blow over. And um, and he was like, I, and he, you know, he's like, I found this this great song. It's a uh, Sly and Family Stone song uh, called uh, "If You Want Me to Stay," and um, it's a great tune. And um, uh, we started jamming along to it, but. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't really get it. I wasn't developed enough in my improvising skills. Mm. And um, so then he was like, you know, he's like, well, let's try a different one. He's like, I, I know a song in the same progression and it's, it's really good. It's another classic. And like, he played it for me on, when we were on tour because uh, things opened up again and we got on tour. Mm. And it's like, okay, show me this video, this YouTube video of like Bobby Hebb and Ron Carter uh, playing, I think it was Ron Carter on bass, playing this version of Sonny. And I had my, my Blair Digital Channel at the time, and we just started playing it together. And, um, and and by that point, my improvising had taken off, and like I was able to actually like blow over the changes and stuff. And so, mm-hmm. you know, and so, um, so yeah, I think uh, when we got together after that tour to practice, you know, we were just like, well, let's let's try Sunny, you know, because we were looking for something that I could that I could improvise over easily. And that you know it was a recognizable tune, and we just I don't know it just kind of clicked. And so we're like, well, let's let's put Sunny, let's do Sunny. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so we did it. Oh, I'm glad you did it. I think it's a great track. And this was the Thanks, this, this was the one that really like also like lit the thing up in my head that made me go, man, this the cohesiveness of your of your bass and rhythm section, you know, like ah. again, that's not to leave the pipes out, but it's like it's such a strong strong foundation to be blowing any solo mm-hmm. instrument over. You know, those guys are those guys are locked in. Yeah, yeah, they're both uh, they're both you know very studied and in, in the you know in the instruments. I mean, Mike Mike went to school um, at Temple University and you know, majored in uh, jazz performance um, on drums. And Armando, uh, yeah, a classical upright bass uh, you know uh, performance major has a master's. So are, are they also both really really tall? Because like I, I the the cover the cover of this photo is like. Okay, yes. hang on. Either the piper is a short guy, or he just went and carefully picked out the tallest possible bass player and percussionist he could find. Well, it's both. It's both. A little bit I mean, of both. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty short in stature, but those guys are definitely on the taller side. So, I mean, like I, I'd seen some like YouTube videos of you guys playing and stuff, but you're usually pretty spread out on the stage, yeah. you know. And yeah. so then that that cover photo, it's like, oh, hang on a sec, your bass drum barely clears their heads, you know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Big yeah. Guys. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I think that's on my mom's side of the family. You know, a lot of short Brazilians. Um, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you know, back, <laughs> back down south. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, tell me more. Uh, so, I guess Clark Park is is another one that I don't I I don't mean to beat the Rufus Harley uh, horse to mm. death, but that's that's one that like if I hadn't known listening to that track, I would have been like, man, this sounds like Rufus Harley. <laughs> was that a, was that on purpose too, or is that just some of the influence no. coming through? Not at all. That was that was a tune that Mike wrote. Um, that's one that Mike wrote, really. Yeah, maybe yeah, it's a power this... suggestion then. But it, like that, that one to me, I was like, is this off of off of a Rufus Harley album? Like it, it felt that way to me. I love that it feels that way because that's definitely not the intention. Like Mike is uh, really into like prog rock. Mm. Like he likes uh, he listens to a lot of Yes. He's mm-hmm. like a Rush fanatic, and um, yeah, you know, like stuff that I never listened to growing up. I was more of a punk rock fan. So, um, mm. uh, yeah, the, so the yeah, only so note that I attached to this tra- uh, to this track on my notes is I put, "Do you listen to Rufus Harley much by chance?" <laughs> <laughs> that was the only thing I put on there. <laughs> I love, I love, I mean, I love that that's where, you know that's where where your mind went with it. But but yeah, this was <clears throat> I think in Mike's own words, it was uh, if Wayne Shorter and Yes like wrote a wrote a song together. That's that's <laughs> so how he likes he's to put together a dream team for this one. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's cool. but yeah, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's really fun to play live. I, I really like the song.
I'm, I'm trying to think to myself, like, after I edit this all together, is there any such yeah. thing as too many samples? There's, there's not. There's not. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's look at another one. Um, can you tell me anything about, we, we mentioned before, farewell to King's Hessing. Um, so, like, like, even though I think most people would say that, like, The Cultivator is their favorite of your tracks, I would guess. I mean, I love The Cultivator, and it, it's kind of a standout tune, right? Is it, um, this one... Like, if I had to choose a favorite, this one would be in the running of, of the studio stuff you've put out. I like this tune a lot. Um, oh, great. Thanks, uh, man. Do I hear Armando doubling up on your drones with the bass? Or are there are there some, like, I, I guess I guess what I'm asking is, like, what how much post work goes into some of these tracks? Like, where you're, where, where you're recording the drones and the chanter separately, like, do you have, is there any limit to how wild you'll get with what you do afterward? Do you add synth? Do you, do you, you know, like, like, is there any limitation? Because... And what's going on with this one? You know, is there is there a whole lot going on in the background that's subtle that I, you know, that maybe I couldn't put my finger on, but listening to it, it's like not just drone. is really strong there's like oh. a, a mix of like shifting grooves and rhythms going on uh -huh. um but it, it, it all I, like maybe it's just maybe it's just the headphones i had on or something but it's like sometimes it mm. felt like there was more than just drones um kind of tonally filling up the space and i wondered if like if you had some uh, some synths or no. maybe maybe three or four tracks of drones and you were doing different you know different ambient yeah. settings for them or something like that actually that's not the case with huh. this tune yeah i think you know <clears throat> like 48th dream obviously um you know clark park you know i did electric um pipes on there too um and then uh but this one this was just uh this was just this was just bagpipes uh oh, recorded. yeah drones tracked separately from the channer and then um we, we tracked this recording too so we actually we went in separately and recorded our own parts to like a click but um you know, whereas for like Sunny, like that was that was like the third out of like four, you know, live takes. Oh, gotcha. So, just, just everybody playing all at once, huh? Yeah, yeah, because we wanted to get the feel, like you know, like the the jazz albums, like yeah. they would go into the studio and just improvise, take like you know, take the best take out of the bunch. Dude, this is this is a tangent, but where where you're a, a jazz guy, um, there's this. <coughs> have you heard of this this piano album that um oh what's what's the comedian's name now? I want to say Benjamin. He uh, he does the voice of oh. Bob from Bob's Burger and BoJack Horseman. <laughs> oh yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> what is that guy's name? It's, it's important. I got I got to figure out what his name is. Uh, yeah, John Benjamin. H. John Benjamin. Did you oh, yeah. know that he did a piano jazz album? I have no idea. Okay, look, this has nothing to do with your music, so I apologize. But I feel like this needs to be this needs to be out there in the world as much as possible. The album is called "I Really Should Have." Subtitle: Learned how to play piano. <laughs> At least I think that's what it is. He didn't know yeah. how to play piano. He hired like a jazz quartet, quintet, something like that, you know, like, <clears throat> like you know, oh, maybe yeah. it was just a trio. It's definitely a bass, some percussion and maybe mm. guitar. Um, he hired him for a session. <laughs> he didn't tell him he didn't know how to play piano, sat down in the <laughs> studio. They did a whole album and he put it out. <laughs> it's, and he, he played piano. He played piano. Yeah. It, you you got to check it out. Man. It's <laughs> hilarious. It's I'd love so to hear funny. That. It's so you can so tell he had a rhythm section. Yep, he had a full rhythm he, section who definitely knew what they were doing, and then he was just <laughs> soloing over. And just, it's like as you listen to it, you're like, okay, this is obviously a guy who has listened to jazz albums, you know, so like he understands the form, but he has no idea what the black and white keys mean. It's so 
Hey there, friends. Uh, this is me from the future you know, doing the post work on this. I was seriously digressing from the interview at this point anyway, so this seems like the best spot to interrupt the flow of the conversation to insert an ad read. Um, so, you know, just remember, like, same stuff. You, you can follow the show on social media. You can also follow the Freestylers of Piping on social media. And, and David himself, he's got, a, he's got his own account there. I've got links for all this down in the show notes. You can send emails into the show. Um, I've been experimenting with ways to make make the show overall louder and especially make my side of the conversation louder unfortunately you probably noticed in this episode every once in a while my double tracking turns into some echoing there was some oh some sample rate issues or something i'll tell you what this has been a, a real trip learning all kinds of cool stuff here so i apologize if that makes you feel a little dizzy at all um uh just you know stick with me folks i promise the the arc of of improvement is long but it curves toward better sound quality here at the droning on podcast um yeah remember you could leave positive reviews um you can support the show via patreon um and in fact this month well january our, our patreon giveaway you know we do these drawings periodically for for books uh, albums um t-shirts all that kind of cool stuff so january's giveaway to to patrons of the show was uh, uh one of dr steph's books um so february's giveaway is going to be um the winner's choice, uh, either um, a Freestylers of Piping um, album or uh, some Freestylers of Piping merch because the Freestylers of Piping have merch over at bagpipesplack.com. So support the show, support me, and support the Freestylers of Piping as well. i uh, got some sick merch over there and lots of other cool stuff over there as well. So go check it out. Check out the Freestylers of Piping wherever you can stream good music and even better, go buy some of their albums on Bandcamp. Uh, that, that'd be even better, especially on a Friday. If you hit a, a Bandcamp Friday, then they then that that's 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 the very best. Um, anyway, sorry to interrupt the flow. Let's uh, let's get back to the groove. Uh, back to the back to the chat. Back to the. Uh, man, I am so sleepy. No words whatsoever for this oh, comedy man. to work. You know, that's part of what's so brilliant about it, right? It's I got a oh comedy. My. Wow, because I know like Jeff Goldblum does like a, a whole oh, show, yeah. and he's actually a good. He's actually cast. quite good, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then like Mitch Hedberg, you know, he would have like a stand-up bass player, like you know, playing that, like that's right. walking bass lines, Doing you know, during lines, his bits. Yeah. But I've never heard of the the comedian actually playing the piano and the jokes on the band. <laughs> yep, they did. He, he, I've heard him do an interview about it. He's like, they had no idea. And he said the like the first two or three tracks, like they were confused. Then they got kind of angry, but by the end, they were okay with it. <laughs> oh my god, that's fantastic! Wow, thank you for thank you for telling me about that. Yeah, man, I hope it brings much joy. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's see. So, sorry. Let's reel it back. I wanted to ask you about um, trio part one and two. Were these are these two oh. parts of one big set that you cut in half and stuck something in the middle, or are these two separate things? Uh, yeah, this is one. This is one song um, that we that we split into two tracks. Gotcha. It's also the title of the of the album. Is is this? <clears throat> tell me about that. Was there a reason to call this trio and, and uh, what's special? About uh, the well, I think the reason we called the album trio is because um, Mike originally wanted to title it like three, like with the because he was seeing like some kind of synergy with like three and the significance of three. Like you know, we had become a trio. We started as a quartet. Mm -hmm. um, this is our third album. Oh, um, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. There were some other things in there that I'm missing. Anybody into but, numerology might be recognizing various <laughs> things 
my <laughs> grandpa. Yeah, yeah. But then, but then I think at one point they were like, well, that's so cliche. Like, that, you know, everybody wants to put out the three album like Led Zeppelin, mm-hmm. you know? So we were like, well, let's scratch it. But Mike really was latched onto this idea of three. And so, uh, you know, he's like, well, I've been thinking, he's like, why don't we just call it Trio? So, like, okay. Was there a reason to stick Longshore Hawthorne in there? Like, did that track somehow fit in there from live shows or something? Or did it just feel like this is too long as a single track, so let's cut it in half and put something else in there? Oh, um, well, um, I think I think we were we were going for um, um, we just wanted to split it up. We just wanted to yeah. split it up to to get some more variation, you know? Because <clears throat> I mean, Trio is like a just like a seven or eight minute long jam mm-hmm. i mean um you know i i plug my bagpipes into you know an amplifier and run it through you know an effects chain and um you know the idea was to improvise and kind of showcase some of that gotcha. um, yeah. but but you know um but but yeah it just you know it felt a little too jammy so um we 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 split it into a couple tracks and then that other track longshore hawthorne was probably the most experimental thing we did mm-hmm. on that album and that has a lot of um synth stuff you were asking about that earlier. yeah so yeah who who plays those when those need to go in do you have one guy in the team who really likes that or is it a collaborative yeah thing? um armando uh we couldn't have put we couldn't have made this album the way we did without him he was like the missing piece when it came to like all the studio stuff he, he really dug into like ableton live mm-hmm. and uh and just kind of like, you know, just kind of like let the creative wheels spin and just like had a ball. And like, we're so grateful that like, you know, he brought that level of uh, expertise and um, creativity to it because Mike and I, I mean, you know, we didn't possess that, you know, ourselves. So, so is he kind of your mix and master guy too? Or do you guys, um, you know, go to a studio and hire somebody to do processing and stuff too? Um, no, I have a guy that I go to. His name is uh, John Myers. Um, he has a what his website's called getmixed.net. Hmm. and uh, he's a, like he's a, a industry guy. He's got a lot of experience, um, mostly in like hip hop and R and B and pop. Mm-hmm. But um, so, but I met him through a friend of mine, uh, a bass player, and a um, and uh, and uh, so yeah. So every now and then I'll be like, Hey, John, you know, I got some more bagpipe stuff for you to mix. <laughs> Is, is, I don't know. is he excited about that or does he kind of roll his eyes like here it comes again <laughs> I, I have no idea but he's such a nice guy like he's so professional yeah and, like his emails and stuff and like it took him a while to like get our sound because at first like you know r&b production is so different from like what we're going for right you know and so he you know he like put a lot of compression on everything and like polish up the bass and just like you know it, it, it was just like no sorry this isn't the feel and mm-hmm. so and so I had to talk to my friend, uh, the bass player, and ask him, like, okay, what do I tell him to get him to, you know, to, to make it sound the way I want it to sound? He's like, give me a couple keywords. It was like, okay, like live, like a jazz trio, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, transparent, I think was the keyword. Transparent, so, huh? Yeah. So, yeah. So just unprocessed, you know. And so, like, finally, you know, I got, you know, after a lot of back and forth between John, I, you know, I got the, the mix that I was looking for. Um, yeah. And and so he did the mastering for us too and we couldn't be happier with the results oh yeah it sounds really great i mean like at this point i've listened to it on loudspeakers bluetooth (coughs) headphones corded headphones you know kind of in the car kind of all the mediums and it's always sounded great to me for sure 
Cool. Uh, Thanks, man. It, it feels like like that's uh, surely this is challenging with any genre of music, but it does feel like bagpipes maybe maybe because of how rare it is that a professional would come across them, and so there's not as much of a library of experience out there. But it does seem like the way that it is captured in the mic and then the way that it's mixed afterward can make a huge difference you know there are some bagpipe albums out there that like i know that the playing is excellent but i can hardly listen to it because it's almost yeah. painful you know to to the ears physically and there yeah. are other albums too out there where you go the piping's great sure but whoever mixed this is an uh-huh. artist because this that's you know like the depth of the drones and the you know the clarity of the chanter it's it's such a such a challenging thing i think to to get a good mix out you know yeah, yeah, and a lot of, I mean, yeah, this is our best sounding album production wise, in my opinion, mm-hmm. out of the three. Um, the first album sounded really, I think, really good, but it was mm-hmm. it was a completely different approach. Um, the second studio album um, was not quite the production value that I had hoped for, um, but this one I feel like really hit it out of the park. And a lot of what it came down to was just like microphone research. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, I had my got to get my hands on a, a nice vintage mic from the same bass player that hooked me up with uh, Big John, the mm-hmm. guy who mastered our album. And so I got to hear what the bagpipe sounded like through, you know, through like a vintage AKG C, uh, C414. Mm-hmm. And so um, I realized like that was just the mic that I wanted to use. And so kind of uh, saved up and, you know, uh, splurged on some, some good studio gear. And that's kind of where I think the bulk of our sound on the album came from was just having the right mics. Gotcha. Now, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm digging into this too much. I don't want to be boring to anybody, but like, this is very interesting to me because, because of that, because like, I'm always curious, like how, how did they do that? You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. when I found out that Ross Miller had tracked his drones and Chanter separately on his, the mm-hmm. Roke album, um, I was mm-hmm. like, Oh, you know, like, oh, you can do that, you know, like that makes that makes sense and it makes things different, you know. And so like mm. what like a lot of a lot of my piping friends, you know, like especially through the pandemic, a lot of us have had to get some sort of microphone to continue yeah. competing or stuff like that. And a lot of us have turned to just like hobby recording as well, you know, and yeah. so like myself and a lot of other people, too. We have like these simple little like H2N zoom mics and stuff like that. Um, so like when you're recording, like with that nice mic and stuff, you know, are you <clears throat> I guess since you're recording the drones and, and chanter separately, you know, in, in separate takes, are you doing them both through the same mic? Or do you, like, when you do the drones, do you do all three at once? Do you do clip mics on the end of each one? Like, I don't know, maybe it's different from track to track, but I'm just curious, like, for you so far, what do you, tell me a little more about what you like and what the process is. I'm, I'm curious to know. Yeah, um, so the, the microphone that I, that I borrowed to record the pipes, uh, on Tupelo Turn with was was a it's a vintage AKG C414 BULS, which is a very uh, favored mic for its flat frequency response, hmm. and um, you know it's 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 actually like the preferred mic for a lot of uh, uh, drum overhead um, producers hmm. like for the put the put a pair of them over the over the drums. So for for this album for Trio, I actually found a variation of uh, the AKG C414 uh, BOS called a TL2, and it actually has a little bit of a hyped uh, high end to it. So um, I think this is actually kind of against what a producer's conventional theory would say is why would you hype the high end on an instrument that's already so trebly? Right. But yeah. I said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, um, so I picked up a TL2. And I actually also got a um, uh, a tube, uh, a vintage. It's not a, it's not vintage. It's made by uh, Universal Audio, but it's a tube preamplifier. Mm-hmm. And so I put the put the the TL2 through the tube amplifier to kind of like warm up the sound a little bit and bring out some of the, the low end. So um, so I used that on my channel. I used um, on the the TL2 through a tube preamp um, mm-hmm. on the channel, and then I ended up using the same thing on my drones. Um, but I, I don't think, it, you know, I, I, I think I could have gotten away with just using like a regular BOLS um, without the tube pre on the drones. But mm-hmm. yeah, I just decided to kind of like go all in with the with the with the tube. Sound, yeah. So, oh, yeah. it does sound great. And it's it's also like, of course, it's not to say like this is the only way to do it. Right. Like all the, everybody's going to have a different way to do it. That's part of why I'm so curious, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I know that like 
uh, Judy Barker, who's who's done like pipe and song. She has like small pipes and she sings with them. She yeah. talked about how like she cannot do separate tracks. She needs to be doing all of it at once, right? Oh, or, or she doesn't feel like yeah. she can do it at all. And so she gets you know four or five mics all around her. One kind of oh. focused on the drones. One kind of focused on yeah. her mouth. One kind of focused on the chanter, right? And then one for overall yeah. or something something along those lines. Wow. And th- there are it different was... ways to do it, you know. It's... Yeah, you know, it's funny though because I actually had a. Yeah, it was actually a little bit of a challenge at times because, um, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to cite my, my own uh, skills or anything like that, but, um, you know, the pressure between blowing just drones and blowing, you know, chan- and mm-hmm. drones is different. Yeah. And there's fluctuation. And then also, like, uh, yeah, it's in, in for certain tracks, like, uh, I had to pitch the shifts down using, like, software mm-hmm. because of changes in my blowing, like, for certain parts of the tune. And, yeah. or or just or just the channel going sharp in the studio yeah like yeah but but yeah actually you know so <laughs> um, so you kind of there's the trade-off it's like you get a little bit more flexibility but at the same time like you also have to compromise for the inconsistencies that might be presented given mm-hmm. that scenario as well so no that that, that totally makes sense i, I i've yeah. heard i've heard I'm, I'm not a percussionist myself but i've heard uh percussionists talk about the challenge of individual track recording if they don't have something to be playing along with because like it's like there's something about the the necessary focus to keep a steady beat for a really long time like three four minutes without like a melody to be playing with it's like it's it's so hard just to stay focused for that long even if it's a simple beat and i'd imagine maybe something similar with keeping your drone steady like sure you can keep them steady all by themselves for 30 seconds but two minutes four minutes six minutes it's a long time to really focus on one thing even with, yeah. you know, on the surface, a simple thing, it, it can be hard. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's an art form. And I mean, like, I, like, I think, I think, you know, I'm learning, we're, we're learning as we go, you know, like this yeah. whole, this whole project, the freestyle as a pipe and was an, ex, you know, an experiment from the start and like recording and production is something that we're learning along the way as well. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, um, so I want to end with the cultivator. And so I'd like to ask you maybe a little bit about that too, but I thought maybe, maybe we could sneak in one more track before that. Um, sure, sounds I thought good. Maybe either get Hyphy or Perseus. Do you have a preference? Do you, do you like one of those over the other, or have something to say about one versus the other? Well, I have more to say about Perseus because it's one that I wrote. Oh, good, because that's actually between the two. That's my favorite, and so I, I okay. <laughs> especially when that buzz saw comes in, you know, kind of, kind of, man, that's so freaking cool.
Okay, so Perseus uh, is is at its core, it's a P-Brock. Um, you know, uh, I wrote this uh, as, a, as a breakup song, is really what it Aww. was. Yeah, um, you know, so it's a lament for, mm-hmm. you know, for, for the relationship that was. Yeah. You know, it's sort of how I got out my feelings at the time. Yeah. I was listening to a lot of Black Sabbath, um, a lot of uh, Denzel Curry. Uh, and good uh, breakup music. Yeah, yeah, Black Sabbath and, and you know and, and hardcore raps from Florida, you know, that's mm-hmm. that's a good way to go through a breakup. So anyway, so out of all that, you know, came uh this idea for a P rock. I was just like I ex- you know, needed to get it out on paper because that's usually what I do, you know, with music. It's 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 a form of expression, writing and stuff. So um so I started writing this P rock. And you know, meanwhile I'm I've also been, I'm also really into like um doom metal and uh, stoner metal. Mm-hmm. which are like you know derivatives that were basically came from black sabbath you know and uh darker side of things and and i've always seen this like this parallel between like doom metal and p rock for some reason interesting but, yeah but because because doom metal is really slow and it's mm. heavy it's it's heavy like yeah. you know emphasis on the heavy like it's just and to me that's what a lot of p rock can be sometimes too like the first p rock i ever heard was the flame of wrath for squinting patrick sure yeah and like Great even one. then I, I recognized like how macabre it was you know and how dark and so like that, that was one my first subject impression. matter as well as musicality that one's one that really gets its uh <laughs> gets its message through its music doesn't it <laughs> yeah and that was the first one i heard live at like a piping you mm. know piping school when i was like when i was like you know 12 or 13 years old mm. so so to me, like, it just seemed natural for, like, doom metal and P-Rock to come together. And, like, given, you know, my mood at the time and, you know, what was going on in my life. Yeah, I don't want to, like, force you to, like, like <laughs> say anything about your past love or anything like that, right? But it does occur to me, like, wait, didn't Perseus kill Medusa? Isn't, isn't that what Perseus did? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Wasn't it Perseus oh, that beheaded Medusa? Is that what's going on here? <laughs> the, the funny thing is I actually know nothing. I have very no, very little about the mythology, actually. Um, okay, there, there's, Perseus... there's some kind of collective unconscious thing happening in your head then because there's definitely a story there. <laughs> yeah, we're about to get really meta because the reasons it's called Perseus is way different. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'm not sure if you're into like astronomy, but um, there's this galaxy... Uh, cluster of galaxies called the Perseus uh, cluster of galaxies, hmm. and I think scientists measured like um, uh, a, a, like a like a, a note from the black hole at the center of this galaxy cluster. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm googling it like, right now. Yeah, it's supposedly yeah supposedly like the black hole is emitting a pitch that is 42 octaves below a B flat. Interesting. So it's like, so it's like a B flat, but just like as low as you can go. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not even audible, you know, by the human ear. ear. Right, so if you right. pitch it up, you know, that then you can actually determine the pitch. But so I'm like, okay, so my drones are in B flat. I got the doom metal thing going on. And, um, and like, we're talking heavy. So Perseus, like how heavy could you be? You know, how heavy could you get, yeah. you know, B flat. The density 42 of a octaves. black hole. That's pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah, and meanwhile, the whole time I'm also I started listening to this band called Sun. Uh, they, you know, they, uh, they, they, uh, they're a drone metal band, which also goes hand in hand with bagpipes sure, because they course. play drone music. Yeah. So and like and like I'm like I'm trying to you know and I'm doing this electric bagpipe stuff and I'm trying to get my pipes to sound heavy, and uh, you know I read about what type of amps they use to get their tone, mm. and they use these these Sun Model T amplifiers from the 1970s, which are just like brutal sounding, and so like. I, I communicated with this amplifier manufacturer, this guy who was trying to resurrect the Model T from the 70s by doing like clone reproductions, this guy in uh, in uh, Sweden. And, you know, he contacts me out of the blue and he's like, I want to make you an amp. So I'm like, all right, okay. So like, anyway, so I acquired one of these Sun Model T amplifier. It's a clone. And I put my bagpipes through them. And like, that's that buzzsaw sound that you get oh, at the end. Oh, gotcha. I do like that and a lot. That's Thanks, man. Mm. And so, so, so anyway, so long story short is that whole, like, that's, that's what's supposed to bring in the doom metal. Like when you hear the drone, like that, that buzzsaw, like that, that is pure and raw amplified, like bagpipes through a Sun Model T amplifier that's with awesome. distortion. 
Yeah, and, and so and, and you're so telling me that it's yeah. it's it's p- matching the pitch of the the black hole <laughs> out in yeah. the Perseus cluster. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's <so> yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. So so it's supposed to be dark and it's supposed to be heavy and it's supposed to be. I mean, I'm I'm super happy with the way Perseus came out because it just you know put together everything that I've wanted it to be. You know, it's just it's got yeah it it. it I love it. I'm really happy with how that how that track came together. Well, the, I love I love it too. And I, I let me just make clear that I, um, if anybody out there is seeing connections between Perseus beheading Medusa and you breaking up with your girlfriend, <laughs> I'm not saying that was the case. That's a coincidence. I'm not... <laughs> 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 Symbolically, so. maybe not, huh? Well, very much so. It's uh, <laughs> it fits on. It works on so many levels, huh? It's beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like the Rufus thing, um, right? You yeah, know, being being more meta look. than it was. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was not the intention, but man, <laughs> it's a coincidence. Sure seems to fit. <laughs> yeah, well, that's wow. cool, man. That's really cool. So, um, before we dive into the cultivator, I'm curious, like, what's next? You guys just finished up a round of Rem Fair stuff, right? Yeah, we were on the road for three months. Um, played a played um, Wisconsin. Uh, the Bristol Renaissance Fair, which is in Wisconsin outside of Chicago. Played the Tuxedo uh, New York Renaissance Fair, which is outside New York City. And then uh, we debuted uh, our act at, uh, for the first time, we played at the Maryland Renaissance Festival, which is like one of the premier um, venues for, mm-hmm. for for any act, you know, any music act on the, on the fair circuit. So uh, we actually performed a uh, with ej jones uh piper jones his band was out there as well nice. and they're a great uh trad uh group doing stuff like uh very cool very cool uh like breton music and yeah. um, other influences yeah, he's, he's he's been a friend of the band for many years so that's awesome so so looking good for another round of tours next year i guess <laughs> yeah we're, we're we're working out our tour schedule uh current actually yeah we're, we're, we'll be going to florida for a for a, another renaissance fair in january mm-hmm. and um and i actually just booked our first um bar gig uh we have a we have a like a traditional like you know rock venue type gig coming up um at the end of the year uh, on december 30th we're going to be playing in santa monica at this venue called trip bar um and uh it's cool because i'm gonna get to do my uh electric you know stuff like i'm actually gonna plug into the amplifier that yeah. they have at the bar and i'm gonna bring my effects pedals and uh i've been looking for you know an opportunity to bring this stuff out live and uh haven't had one yet because of these renaissance fairs we kind of have to keep it a little right uh, i'd imagine there's a limit to what <laughs> what modern technologies they'll let you kind of show on stage there huh yeah, yeah, we have to pretend like we're not amplifying the bass, right? You know? Yeah, like <laughs> he's just plucking it real hard back there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. No, that's cool, and it's also it's funny to me that like, you know, you would guess that any group would start doing bar gigs and work their way up to something else, you know, rather than like spending months on tour <laughs> and then be like, finally, we got a bar gig, you know? Yeah. Well, it's it, here's the thing about Rumsbergs, like they pay. Yeah, like, yeah, they actually pay like, and I mean, as a bagpiper, you know, prior to Renaissance Fair, it was the only paying gig I ever had was like a funeral or yep. a wedding. It and takes my, a lot of funerals and weddings to add up to a living. <laughs> All you it can really, really does. Do is hopefully, take the edge off your expensive hobby. <laughs> yeah. So, so while it's not my preferred venue, you know what I mean, the Renaissance Fair, like it, it's a, it's, it's one in which you know we can really get a lot of practice and like, yeah you know, we can work and meld our, our sound, you know, while we're, you know, basically, you know, earning a living, you know, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a great opportunity. You know, it, I, I certainly wouldn't be the musician that I am had I not joined, you know, today, had I not joined the Renaissance Fair. Circuit. Well, you need, you need those kinds of like, like long, constant kind of putting in the reps kind of thing, right? It's like, it's like Liverpool yeah. for the Beatles, right? You need some, yeah. some like, really focused time at the at the front end to to kind of figure out who you are and get rid of the butterflies and all that kind of stuff exactly yeah yeah well man i can't thank you enough for taking the time this has been a lot of fun and uh i i'll have links in the show notes to to your music on Bandcamp and stuff on youtube and of course you guys can be found on all the major 
music streaming and purchasing platforms, right? Um, before we yeah. before you tell me about the Cultivator, do you have anything else you want to plug real quick? And I'll put applicable links down below. Um, just you know, check us out on Instagram. Uh, you know, please follow us on Facebook. Um, you know, we love we love when people stream our music. Um, you know, on Spotify. Uh, just uh, please, you know, tell your friends. Um, you know, we're we're a, we're a independent band. You know, we we release all our stuff ourselves, um, and you know, we 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 want to take it as far as we can. But <clears throat> it's hard when you don't have like label support, and it's even harder when you're playing bagpipes and trying to sell it to people. You know, who mm-hmm. don't normally listen to bagpipe music. So, you know, please, uh, you know, support independent music. Uh, support us, and also listen to Rufus Harley. Uh, yeah, amen. you know, give, give this man the love, you know, that he, uh, deserves because, you know, his vision was truly unique. And, um, you know, I, I wish, I wish, you know, I wish the whole world would listen to Rufus Harley. So please, you know, su- support the freestylers of piping and listen to Rufus Harley. Those are my, those are, that's, that's all that I ask. <laughs> Beautiful. Now I can, this is, this is stepping out of the interview. I can either have exactly what you just said, fade into the cultivator and we could just end with that. Or do you want to tell me anything about the cultivator? And as you're telling me about it, as you get to the end of telling me about the cultivator, that's where I'll fade it in. Um, it's up to you. I don't mind talking about the cultivator though. No, nah, tell me a little bit about the cultivator and then I'll just see what fits best in post. Okay, cool. All right. So the cultivator, uh, yeah. So I wrote this tune, uh, dedicated it to, um, the, uh, Eli, Elijah Wolcott, who is the, the second bagpipe. Well, when we first started the band, we were a quartet. We were two bagpipers and two drummers. And uh, Eli Wolcott was our second bagpiper. Uh, he had uh, just come out of this band that he formed called, he started called Kudu. And uh, when, when he left Kudu, he joined us. And um, anyway, uh, eventually Eli departed the Freestylers of Piping. Um, he found a job in the uh, marijuana cultivation uh, industry. And uh, he actually, uh, you know, shoot, I don't know if I can say this. I'm kind of putting him on blast, but he posted on Facebook all the time. You know, this is what he does. Like he, he quit our band to grow marijuana. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's basically how it goes. It's and so I don't know. Or... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we were living in LA. So, um, so, you know, um, he, he started all, working. There's with... just a lot of South Park episode references coming to my mind immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe this isn't where you want your podcast interview to go, but he, you know, he basically, (laughs) this is how we're ending it. This is perfect. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) He quit the freestylers to grow marijuana commercially. And um, so, you know, I was sad to see him go, but I was, you know, I was happy for him because, you know, he found a career that, you know, that fit his lifestyle and, um, and, you know, and, and so I supported him. And uh, this is my way of saying farewell, Eli, you know, I hope, you know, you're, your fields are green and, and plentiful and you know you know you have some good crops you know but we miss you in the freestylers and you know this tune's for you here's you know this is the cultivator so <laughs> i think that's beautiful i think that's a great way for us to go into the cultivator may your may your fields be ever green and your, and your, your bankroll as well
Uh, just a tiny little postscript. Um, David did indeed reach out to Eli to check how he, he how he might feel about about his um, award winning um, grass growing uh, being mentioned in the show. And uh, yes, indeed, he was cool with us leaving it in. He was just sad that David didn't mention that he has won some awards for his excellent crop. It's that good. Um, so. Uh, many congratulations to you, Eli. And once again, um, go buy music by the freelancers. The f <laughs> freelancers. <laughs> I'm so sleepy.